We are here for IEP alignment and disability alignment, Dib 1. This is our team. I am Jennifer Gleason, and I'm here with Julie, who is our Super Wrangler. Um, this is our contact information. Any questions as they come up when you're writing IEPs or anything, reach out to us anytime. We love to hear from you. So. Um, link to the procedural manual um, at the end. And when you, you'll fill out a form to get your contact hour. And when you get your contact hour certificate, you will get a copy of this PowerPoint. So you'll be able to access these links. Um, procedural manual is great to have right next to you when you're doing anything um, DOE forms. And of course, user near and dear to our heart. This is just a visual um, of alignment, just one of the, a few that we use. Um, whatever visual works for you, use it. We all like a visual. Um, this is a little part of Muser that I just want you to kind of keep in the back of your head as we go through um, talking about alignment. What it says is if you have something in one part of the IEP, you don't need to repeat that information anywhere else. So like your evaluation scores go in section 4A, you don't need to put them anywhere else. You don't need to repeat yourself through the IEP. All right, so we start with, we're gonna kind of go through the IEP in order. Um, and how everything aligns. So the first thing obviously is how evaluations align with that exceptionality identification. And in order for me to make sense of it in my head, I think of it as the scientific process because I'm a science girl. So I'm sure way back in high school, you learned about the scientific process. So you do your background research, which is your RTI MTSS, right? You come up with a hypothesis. I think this student might be eligible under OHI for ADHD. You do evaluations that can either um, support or not support that hypothesis, right? You pick those evaluations, which ones can support that hypothesis. You review the evaluations. You either say, yep, that hypothesis is true it's false or it's partially true. Typically, if it's partially true or even sometimes when it's false, you, the team might say, you know, maybe we should do this other evaluation and that will kind of get us the rest of the way. We're almost there. Let's do this other evaluation. So you go back, right? You do those other evaluations and um, kind of go through that process again. This is what it looks like on the IEP form. So OHI for ADHD, and you have um, that child behavior checklist in addition to the other um, cognitive and um, academic um, evaluations that can support that hypothesis of OHI for ADHD. Section three is kind of your outline um for your IEP kind of what do you need to include in the IEP so your evaluations and identification are kind of intertwined and you're going to use those to help determine those academic and functional skill gaps but you're going to you're going to drill down to more specific skills than you're gonna get from the, um, the evaluation. So the evaluation might tell you that um, a child has deficit in executive function. But as we know, there are a lot of skills involved in executive function. So in this case, um, the child has gaps in following a visual schedule and requesting a help. So you're gonna take those broad um, evaluation scores and just drill down to more specific skill gaps. And don't forget the how statement. So here we have those two skill gaps, follow visual schedule and request help. 
and we need a present level. And you could see this arrow is goes in two directions because you need to have alignment both ways. We'll talk about that in a minute. So your present level is your baseline data for that specific skill gap. So we have two skill gaps. So we need two pieces of baseline data. So follow visual schedule. Our baseline data is Sammy is unable to follow a visual schedule. He's at zero. We haven't probably haven't introduced it yet. So unable. Um, request help with adult prompting. Sammy uses a help card to request help in 50% of opportunities. So there is our baseline data for that specific skill gap. And then we have a goal, right? Each gap is going to get a present level is going to get a goal. And that goal is going to be measured using that data point that we use for our baseline data, right? So Sammy is unable to follow a visual schedule. We want him to um, follow the task analysis with 40% independence. So we're going, he can do it. Oh, he can't do it at all. And we want him to get up to 40% over five consecutive days. And with a help card, he can exchange a help card with adult prompting and 50% of opportunities. And we want him to do it independently in 40% of opportunities. So we have our baseline data and our goal are the same data point. And then of course, we don't expect the kids to achieve those goals by themselves. We're gonna help them with special education and related services. So as we always say, every goal needs a service, every service needs a goal. So um, when we come and do our file reviews, we will check every time we look at a goal, we'll check if there's a service to support that goal. And when we're checking the service grid, we make sure there's a goal for every service. Consultation is a hot topic that comes up a lot. Um, consultation is a service and it needs to be tied to a goal because every service needs to be tied to a goal. Um, if you're just talking about teacher to teacher check-ins um, broadly that aren't tied to a goal, that would go in section six, and we ask you to please call it collaboration or something that is not consultation because consultation is a service and needs to be tied to a goal. We have an example. Um, you can see the second goal here, given specially designed instruction and BCBA consultation. So you can absolutely share goals. When I was teaching, I shared goals with my BCBA and my speech path all the time. Um, so you can share that goal, but you have to have both of those services in section seven. So you could see there's SDI for executive function and VCBA consult in the service grid tied to that goal. And then we have the dotted line, which is section six, supplementary aid services, modifications and supports. Um, if you're referencing some kind of support or accommodation in a goal, make sure it's listed in section six. So for our example, um, we have a goal around visual schedule and a goal around requesting help using a help card, right? So we want those visual supports, visual schedule and help card in section six, so they're always available to that student. Once those goals are mastered, right? They won't have that goal anymore, but they're still using those supports, right? We're teaching them a visual schedule because we want them to use it. So that will stay in section six. They just won't, won't be attached to a goal anymore because they've already mastered that goal. And now they're using the visual schedule and they're using the help card um, to help with those communication skills. So if it's in the goal, put it in section six. Once they master the goal, if they're using it as an accommodation or support, keep it in section six. So that that arrow only goes one way. It's not a two-way arrow like those other ones. And it's a dotted line because you can have tons of stuff in section six that are not tied to goals, as you know. Um, wow, we're flying through this. If you guys have questions, 
jump in, put them in the chat box or take yourself off mute, feel free. Um, so you're in your IEP meeting, you've talked about the gaps, you've um, talked about your present levels, your goals, you've figured out the services, accommodations, all of that conversation that you've been having leads to the LRE conversation, right? These are these are the supports the child needs. These are the services. These are the goals they're working on. So how can we make that happen? What is the right environment to make this happen for this specific student? And procedural manual talks about LRE on page 37. Um, just to point out, because this is the bane of my existence, um, the prompt on the IEP um, makes it sound like you need to repeat the service grid in that LRE statement, but that's not what we look for. So we understand that that's very annoying because it's what we ask for, but it's not what we want. Um, what we're looking for is based on this section of MUSER and it's also an IDEA. Um, removal of students with disabilities from the regular education environment shall occur only when the nature or severity of the disability is such that education in regular classes cannot be achieved satisfactorily. So um, this is what we're looking for. What is it about this child's disability, the nature and severity of the disability that we have to pull them from the regular classroom to um, provide SDI? have a question. The student is referred to CDS without RTI data. Um, is it appropriate to ask for that type of data to help evaluate or see a baseline? If, if you have it, I imagine sometimes you don't have that kind of data. Nobody has it, but um, if they have data from any kind of preschool experience or even talking to parents or something, it might be helpful. Um, if you can do some kind of observation. I know that referrals to CDS are probably gonna have the least data of any <laughs> kind of student. Um, we get that. Um, and you probably have a lot of, um, like that one goal we had unable to follow a visual schedule. And it might just be that you haven't done a visual schedule with them, so you don't know that. Right, so you're gonna put unable to because you haven't done that. If you have the opportunity, which I know you often probably don't, um, but if you have the opportunity to just do a couple quick probes with the child, if you have time with them, that's your baseline. Even if you do something once with them, that's your baseline data. That's where you're gonna start working on that goal. So at least you have something, but I know CDS is, is hard to get that initial data. I don't know if that answered your question or just restated your difficulties. <laughs> um, so this is an example of Sammy. Sammy's OHI due to ADHD is to such a degree that he requires individual and small group instruction in the special education environment. So ADHD, he's gonna have trouble learning in that large group. He needs that individual or small group. This is why we need to pull him from that gen ed environment. So that's what we're looking for in that statement. Any other questions before we move on to the disability alignment stuff? All right, I'm gonna keep going. I'm flying, I know I talk fast, I'm sorry. My apologies, especially to the interpreter. Um, I try. <laughs> All right, disability alignment. So we went through how everything is aligned. Um, the key here is the exceptionality identification drives your programming. And your programming needs to address that identification. So if you have a student um, identified with OHI for ADHD, you need to make sure that your programming in the IEP addresses OHI for ADHD. So we're gonna have some examples. Um, IDEA and MUSER go through each um, identification and there's a definition and a procedure for a determination for each one. 
So that's kind of a nice place to look um, to kind of think about what kind of programming you need for this child. I mean, obviously it's individualized based on their evaluations and that kind of stuff, but um, we'll go through a few examples. So intellectual disability, significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning existing concurrently with deficits in adaptive behaviors, right? So just based on that definition, right? If, if a student is identified with ID, they must have both of these things, right? By definition, or else they can't be identified with ID. So we would expect to see programming to address both intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior. So this is really a global disability and we would expect to see programming to address both of those things based on the definition of ID. Um, OHI for ADHD, they talk a lot about behavior, right? You need observations that include comparison of the referred identified student's behavior to same age peer behavior. They talk about behavior scales, um, measuring features of attention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity across multiple settings. So there's a lot of talk about behavior in this definition. And this is actually the procedure for determination. So we would expect to see programming that addresses behavior, attention, hyper hyperactivity, impulsivity, executive function is a big part of ADHD. So um, as appropriate based on those evaluation results, because as we know, ADHD can present different in different students, but those aspects that affect that student, we would want to see programming to address that. So if you have a student with ADHD and only have academic programming, that's gonna get flagged as a Div 1 because ADHD is a functional disability. And the opposite of that, specific learning disability, is the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematical calculations. So I'm sure you figured out those are all academic things. This is an academic disability. So we would expect to see programming to address academic gaps, right? Because that's what this is. Um, we do see often, mostly, middle school, high school, um, a student with SLD and they're doing really well and they're working at grade level, but we just want to put them on consult for another year before we dismiss them from services. So an IEP is written with consultation services, which is fine, but they make a functional goal instead of an academic goal. And that kind of doesn't address the disability, right? You've identified this child with specific learning disability, but you don't have any academic goals. So if you're going to do that, putting them on consult is perfect, but just make sure there's an academic goal um, for that. All right, multiple disabilities, you need to think about the distinct documented disabilities, and there needs to be programming for each identified disability individually. So we should be able to hypothetically take an IEP for a student with multiple disabilities and create an IEP for each of those disabilities with the information that's in the one IEP. That makes sense. It has to address each individually. Um, I'm just going to back up here and point this out too. Um, B down there at the bottom, right? If you cannot determine a primary disability, that's when you um, identify multiple. If you can identify, if they're not equal, if there's one really driving the bus, then you only identify with that one. It doesn't mean you're not addressing the others because an IEP is individualized because that's what the I means. Um, so you can, you know, say a student has um, a specific learning disability and um, maybe a speech language 
if they are affecting that child equally and you can't tell which one is driving the bus, then yes, multiple disabilities. If the SLD is really driving the bus and they just need speech as a related service, then it's not multiple. So it's really about if you can say, this is primary, go with that. Um, if you can't figure out which is primary, then it's multiple and you need to address them all individually. All right, any questions? We're moving on to a quiz, so ask your questions now. It's the time. All right, we're going with the quiz. All right, here we go, multiple disabilities. I think all of my quiz questions are about multiple disabilities. So this is a student with specific learning disability and visual impairment. What kind of goals, services, or supports might we expect to see in this IEP? So throw it into the chat box what you think, or pull yourself off mute, shout it out. I hope you can't hear my dog barking. Nobody, does nobody have a guess? There we go. Small group, maybe. Maybe small group services, yeah. So we would expect to see we would expect to see academic goal services and supports to address the SLD, right? Because that is an academic disability, but also functional goal services and supports to address that visual impairment. I know I've seen IEPs um, with visual impairment checked as part of multiple and there's only accommodations to address that visual impairment. It, if that's the case, it shouldn't be checked as a multiple because unless they need those goals and services for that visual impairment, it's not, it's not affecting that student as much as the SLD if all they need are accommodations for it. So in that case, you would identify SLD and then you're still going to have those accommodations for the visual impairment. You can still refer to it in the evaluations but it's not going to be an identification because you can pull out the primary is the SLD. Um, if you can't pull them apart, then absolutely it's multiple, but we would expect to see goal services and supports to address both. All right, next one. I can get there, but I can't. All right, here we go. OHI and speech and language. So what kind of goals, services, and supports might we want to see here? Yep, we might see social self-regulation for both of those things, right? Those for OHI and for speech and language. Yep, nice, access to adult support. So we would wanna see goal services and supports to address ADHD and goal services and supports to address speech and language impairment because they are equal. They are affecting this child equally. We can't pull out a primary, um, so we want to have all of the support, all of the goals for both of those things. All right, we have a bonus question on this one. A trick. So for this student with OHI and speech language, is speech language a special education service or a related service for this student? I know, I didn't even give you the answer to this in the presentation. Oh, you guys are awesome. Special education service, yes. If the child is identified with a speech language impairment, either by itself or as part of multiple, or if the child is identified with autism and speech and language is their only service, then speech language is a special education service and not a related service. 
Nice job. You guys are awesome. Any questions before we go? And again, if you think of questions later, we are here, available. Um, oh, thank you, Nikki. We love our visuals. Um, so again, you're gonna get this PowerPoint when you get your contact hour and it has all of the rest of our um, PD opportunities, office hours, um, full IEP, B13, and those um, has the registration links right in there. Um, we have a couple if you um, have gen ed teachers that your students are in their class and you want to share this April 1 special ed law for gen ed teachers, that would be really cool. We would appreciate it. And then we have a couple coming up that are um, especially um, appropriate for related service providers. Although we always like to get related service providers in all of our PD. Um, so share those as you like. This is the link um, for your um, feedback and contact hour. We love feedback. We use it. We have changed our PD based on feedback. So be honest. Um, put in your email and there's a drop down. You're going to select. Oh, I wish Carly was here because she knows. Um, it'll say something about alignment and it'll have the date. It'll have um, 11, 8, 23 in there. So select that and Carly will send out your um, your contact hour, this PowerPoint. She sends a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I think the IEP quick reference form. So she sends out a lot of goodies. It's like getting a little goodie bag from the party. So do that. We appreciate it. These are helpful links. Um, the first one is to our PD calendar. The second one is our professional learning page. We record all of these things and we put them up there. Um, we have modules, short modules for each section of the IEP up there, all kinds of stuff. It's much easier to navigate than it used to be. And of course, reach out to us anytime. Um, we love to help you out if you are struggling to um, write a goal or gap something. If, you have, if you're struggling with any part of writing your IEP or any forms and you wanna send us a hypothetical, don't send us the IEP, don't send us any identifying information. We are bound by federal regulations that say if we see something non-compliant, we have to ask you to fix it. And then we have to ask for evidence of systemic correction. It snowballs, it's a nightmare. So if you send us a hypothetical kind of, hey, if I were to write a goal like this, would this be compliant? We are happy to give you feedback on that and work with you on that. So we, we are happy to do it. We see ourselves as one big team we're all special ed teachers, so that's what we like to do. We we like the support part better than the monitoring part of our job, all of us, because we are teachers. So help us out. Reach out to us. Ask questions. Um, if there are no more questions, we are set, and you can go home. All right. Thank you all very much. I'm glad you made it. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>